This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to hide.me slash epicenter and sign up for your free account today. And by Shapeshift. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, counterparty, Dogecoin, Dash, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization in the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have a special guest joining us from Washington. His name is uh, Dr. Robin Hansen. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, we, you could think of him approximately as the Nick Sabo of the prediction market world. He has, uh, he has played a role in, in the technology of prediction markets for the past 20 years, developed some of the main inventions that underlie modern prediction markets, uh, and actually e experimented with different kinds of prediction markets in different areas like uh, with government, with uh, scientific predictions, etc. We'll be talking today about how prediction markets and 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 bitcoins can uh, uh, and 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 bit and uh, blockchain technology is linked, and his experiences developing these solutions for the past twenty past twenty years. Dr. Hansen, we are pleased to welcome you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, actually, it's funny because I was I was. We have been in contact with this guy and about coming on the show. His name is Mark Miller and he's sort of deep in the smart contract space. And he sent me this talk uh, that I was watching last night from 1997 talking about smart contracts. And then in the talk, sort of at one point, the camera surfs over and it shows Nick Salvo, which is sort of funny, right? Because Nick Salvo is thought of as this mysterious person with no face. But he's like there one minute or, or 30 seconds or something. The camera is on his face. Did you see Nick Sabo? <laughs> it's like, well, not so anonymous, I guess. And then in the end, you come up, Robin, and you ask some questions. So I was like, wow. So 1997, you were already thinking about smart contracts in this space. So uh, I'm I mean, not that I young. Know. Yeah, I've been around a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that young, but you were also just there at that sort of nascent stage and, and that, another thing is when i was reading through your blog you see hal finney commenting there in 2008 and 2009 which of course is when bitcoin was created and Hal finney being the first recipient of of the very first bitcoin transaction so so in some tangential way you have been uh, around that bitcoin cryptocurrency blockchain space for for a long time i'm honored to have known these people and uh still honored so perhaps we could begin with uh, what is the prediction market and in your words, understand uh, uh, what does it do and what is it good at? Right. Um, a prediction market is really just a betting market, uh, but we give it a different name maybe when it has a different purpose. So an ordinary betting market on a football game, uh, there was the game and it's, somebody's going to win or lose and you could uh, put money on it and your money will increase if you're right, if you bet on the team that wins and it'll go away if you will bet on the team that loses. So you make bets and a betting market is a place where people can make offers to bet so that the odds adjust to uh, some sort of consensus of what people betting think about the chance of the team winning or losing. A prediction market is uh, a lot like a betting market or really stock markets, currency markets, etc. They're all really the same kind of mechanism. We call them speculative markets. That is uh, something you can buy or sell and the people who buy or sell estimate the value of the thing and the price ends up being an aggregate estimate of what many people think of the value of the asset. And you can try to make money by buying today, buying low today and selling high tomorrow. And a great many of most of the people participating in most uh, financial markets that are thick are actually speculators. They're, they're there to just buy today, sell tomorrow or in a month and hope to make a profit on the difference. They're, they're not actually wanting to hold the thing for a long time. Uh, they're just adding to the information in the price. So a prediction market is just a market like that, but applied to something else where the reason you create the market is because you want to know the answer to something. So uh, you could create a market in a company, say you might have a, a deadline of a project. Will we make the deadline? You might have a let people bet on whether you'll make the deadline. And uh, the 
net effect of people betting will give you some consensus estimate of the chance you make the deadline, say 60%. And that could be, and often is, a much better estimate of the chance of making the deadline than you will get by asking the manager of the project or doing a survey or many other mechanisms for finding out the chance that it'll happen. So a British market is a betting market on something that you care about so that you bother to make the market in order to find the answer to your question. So well, how, how did you become interested in that and what, what do you find so fascinating about this? Well, so I was a, you know, physics student long ago as an undergraduate. And then I got interested in the, you know, physics teachers tell you claims about how like science is different than everything else. And every, you know, the rest of the world is a big mess, but in science, we've got this way to figure out the truth. And that always, always appealed to me. And then digging into it, you try to say, okay, what is it about science that's giving us the truth that other people don't get? And you get various mumbo jumbo, but I wanted to figure that out. So I finally went into philosophy of science graduate school, <laughs> say, well, you know, what is all this stuff? And in the end, it turns out it's a big, complicated social institution that doesn't have any particular simple answers for why it works. And there's just really all sorts of things that can go wrong with it. And then you finally realize in the world, there's all these people arguing about global warming and uh, policy and everything else. And you, you, you get, you realize that these things don't work very well, <laughs> that the institutions we have for figuring out what we should think about uh, the Pope or uh, Russia or China or anything else, uh, they, they're just messed up in all sorts of ways. And so you get interested, well, how could we fix that? And um, I was involved with, um, the World Wide Web in the very early years, uh, before there was a World Wide Web, but you know, with Project Xanadu, uh, and their vision for making the world better was to say, well, debate would be better if, if you could find rebuttals of things. So their th simple theory was, uh, we, we have bad beliefs about things because people say stupid things and you can't find the rebuttals somewhere else. So they were hoping that backlinks on the web would make it easy to find rebuttals and that would fix our bad debate outcomes. And so I was hanging out with them in Silicon Valley in the very early, late eighties, um, and listening to this vision and, and it was exciting, but then eventually decided maybe that doesn't work so well. Backlinks uh, seemed to me uh, a little, they, they wouldn't be sufficient to uh, make debate work and, and to make people not believe stupid things. And so I wondered, gee, what would work? And so, uh, hanging around, uh, this world with, they were mostly libertarians. I naturally, I think, came on the idea, well, what if we were to bet on these things? Uh, if we were to bet on these various issues we were debating, uh, wouldn't that create good incentives, and even in scientific questions? Uh, and so I began to explore that idea back then and started to you know, write about it and give talks on it. And I find that I, I was basically a nobody. I was just a software engineer, research software engineer in Silicon Valley. And so I decided I would go back to school and get a PhD so that I could have contacts and credentials to talk about things like that, which I eventually did. Uh, and so eventually that became part of, you know, my uh, agenda to, in my research agenda and elsewise, that we could improve the world by taking the issues we argue about and then bet on them in addition to just arguing. And that there was a huge potential to apply that to a very wide range of topics that we weren't exploring. In, in the past, what kind of prediction markets have you experimented with? What are some of the projects that you have done with prediction markets and what, what came out of these, these projects? Well, uh, what we know in, in total about prediction markets is of course the sum total of all the different related projects that have happened over the last 30 years, say, uh, because that's the period of time over which people have taken this idea seriously that, you know, the projects I've been personally involved with are a small fraction of all those projects. And so, you know, we learn from all these projects, but I, I originally was motivated to uh, deal with science and um, public policy questions. And so I originally talked about doing that on these things and then, you know, was trying to explore how to do that. The very first things I got anybody to do uh, was the Xanadu Group had some internal markets there at uh, the company uh, on whether they were going to make their deadlines for uh, delivering software. Uh, and they also had some science questions on that. And so that were the first internal corporate markets in the early 1990s um, at Xanadu. Then uh, a, a group of people who were software engineers uh, read some things I had written and then wrote the one of the first web markets. I think it was the first web market and they called it Ideosphere. Um, 
now, at least that's the name now, you can still look it up at ideosphere.com. And that was on science and technology questions, uh, longer term. And then um, other people have you know, developed other predictions. There was the uh, Hollywood Stock Exchange that was developed uh, uh, around then and, and got popular and it was betting on movie markets. Uh, a number of uh, smaller private markets were tried to create it, say within pharmaceutical companies. Uh, then in the around 19, um, late 1990s, I got involved with uh, DARPA, who set up a call for proposals to uh, try out markets in the Defense Department, and that created the uh, Policy Analysis Market Project that I was involved with, and that was uh, exploring technology to apply to the Defense Department. Uh, and you know, in the last few years, I've been involved in an, an IARPA-funded project to uh, apply these technologies or to explore them uh, for intelligence gathering and, and uh, first in foreign affairs and then in science and technology. But over the years, I've been involved in consulting with lots of um, companies and, and projects trying to apply prediction markets inside various organizations. So I've, I've heard a lot about a lot of projects that I wasn't uh, greatly involved in. Uh, and so um, your question was, well, what have we learned? <laughs> Which is a, a, a broad question. Um, so, I mean, so meaning like perhaps, perhaps it's, it's easy for me to specify the question a little further, like, um, like there's, there's two parts to the questions. A, uh, what have we learned about the accuracy of prediction markets and B, what have we learned? What are the reasons why prediction markets have not succeeded on a, on a major scale and the, and the challenges faced by some of your projects in specific? So. Um, you know, the idea of a prediction market, just to be clear, is you have a question and there's some way in which later on you will know the answer to the question, and, but you want an estimate on the question now. And so in order to get that, an answer to your question now, you set up a betting market basically and, the, and you subsidize it sufficiently so that um, the consensus price will exist and enough activity will be set, and then you can look at that current price as the estimate to your future question. So that idea uh, has excited a lot of people and, and drawn a lot of interest. And so a wide range of people have been interested in talking about that idea and exploring it. And that's produced a, a, a set of research in academia uh, where people have tried to test the idea in lab experiments and uh, test some problems that could occur in lab experiments and then develop the technology, i.e. work on uh, mechanics and tools that would make various problems less and very um, harder cases, easier, et cetera. And there still is a, a large uh, intellectual and academic uh, pursuit of the idea um, that's somewhat separate from real organizations who have actual questions applying it to their questions inside their organizations. So uh, that sep second path, uh, unfortunately, is much less well-funded <laughs> and difficult, but it's the path that needs to happen. So. Uh, when organizations like DARPA or IARPA have decided, or even grant, other grant agencies decided to fund work in the area, they typically fund researchers to go study things and develop tools, but they don't aren't very interested in funding like real organizations to actually try it out and to figure out their real problems. So most of the applications in real organizations have been done on you know shoestring budgets and by small groups. Uh, usually by somebody who's just excited by the idea and finds an opportunity to, to try it out. So in those projects, they usually, of course, wisely ignore most of the complexity of the elaborate mechanisms that researchers have developed. <laughs> and they, they, you know, don't go for the uh, sophisticated problems or deep, you know, obstacles or, or pro issues. They, they just opportunistically try the simplest things they can, uh, simple mechanisms, simple questions, and simple applications. And they um, have had um, a somewhat consistent experience, I would say, which is that, well, first of all, the typical person who wants to set one of these things up usually doesn't have much of a budget. They just have a lot of enthusiasm. And so they might you know, set up a market, throw some questions out and, and offer no, not really much incentives. Other than it's just play money or something. And then uh, when something like that happens, they'll they don't really even have strong organizational support and they just say, hey, come and play on your lunch hour or something. And, you know, the, the typical thing that happens there is it crashes and burns, nothing happens, nobody trades, nobody's interested, it doesn't uh, do anything. Um, 
But there have also been markets where somebody higher in the organization had authority and some budget and, and could push it and say, you know, encourage people to participate and offer larger uh, incentives uh, financially and also just praise and organizational recognition. And those markets uh, have typically um, produced accurate estimates in the sense that whenever they've compared the market estimates to some other source they had for estimating the same thing, uh, at the same time, the markets have done as well or better. So there's, a, there's been a very consistent track record of accuracy in these markets. Uh, also a consistent track record of user satisfaction. That is, if they ask people, what do you think about it? Are you enjoying it? Do you feel like your voice is being heard, etc.? cetera? Uh, people tend to like those too. Uh, but in addition, there's also been the, the negative part of this track record is that um, if you go and consult for these organizations, you say, great, you want to set up a prediction market. Let's talk about what, what questions are important to your organization and what, where could the high value be in your organization that you could achieve by asking important questions. They immediately shy away from the most obvious important question saying, well, that will, it's a little sensitive and we don't want to start right there and that could make people upset. And so they shy off to the side of, of relatively safe, interesting, engaging questions, but questions that are not really going to bother anybody. So, so what, what kind of questions do they shy away from? Well, the, you know, the most straightforward is what are your big projects? Uh, are they going to happen on time? Are, are they going to succeed <laughs> in delivering the, the benefits promised? Uh, you know, what are the, your major products and what are the sales going to be? Uh, you know, the sort of who are you going to put in charge of the product and wh whether they make a difference? Uh, are you going to change the requirements, definitions? You know, uh, the, the key big questions on projects and, and uh, products. Uh, and again, those tend to be sensitive. Those tend to uh, have somebody who, who um, and so, for example, uh, the one of the most consistent set of uh, accuracy successes in these markets is to, is estimating whether a project will happen on time, uh, just a de simple deadline forecast. And there's been a lot of examples where prediction markets were set up, and the official management forecast of whether they make the deadline was optimistic, and yeah, we're pretty sure to do it. It looks like we're on track. And then you open the prediction market and the odds just go down to a few percent saying, no way, it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, and those are, they are, of course, consistently right. They, 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 they weren't going to happen. But uh, usually this embarrasses somebody, the guy in charge of the project. It, it makes him look bad. He was saying it was going to happen and the market say, no way. And of course, it doesn't happen. And uh, you might think the management above that layer would be grateful to uh, hear this news from a new source, an independent source. But in fact, usually the guy who's mad uh, that, that the project like made him look bad, complains about it and gets it killed. And uh, so the, you know, and his mark, his, his manager is part of getting it killed. He's, he's, he's saying, no, we don't want this sort of embarrassment to happen. And the project goes away. Uh, so you, you mentioned that there's been a lot of the research interest and there hasn't been so much on, on the sort of these actual projects that then drive decisions. Mm -hmm. Is, is this why? Do you think it just makes people uncomfortable and it disrupts too much existing organizational structures that people just don't want to do it? Well, I mean, this is the key question. So that's why we want to dive in a little detail. I mean, the, the, it, you know, we have a technology here and we want to apply it in real organizations and we want to uh, understand the barriers to adoption. And um, in general, uh, when technologies have to integrate with organizations, uh, part of the barrier to adoption is that your initial concept of the technology and the way it's implemented was based on some abstract concept of its use that wasn't very, uh, didn't accommodate much the actual details of how these things are actually used and the actual issues. So, I mean, this is true for almost all technologies. Uh, if you don't have a very good image of how it will actually be used, and you, you create some prototype versions of the products and you try to get people to use them, you often find that you just missed, misunderstood how these things are used and what are the important features of the product, what are the important costs and, and benefits, etc. cetera. Uh, this, project, this product is a product to produce information inside organizations. And that's a kind of product that we have especially poor understanding of and especially prone to lie about. Uh, that there's a lot of complexity in how organiz in organizations produce and share and use information. And uh, the simple idea that if you just tell them that their project's going to fail and they'd want to hear it is uh, somewhat naive relative to the real political barriers and, and processes going on in organizations. So I think fundamentally uh, academics and idealists sort of 
start with their initial concept of what these things are for and useful for, and then they just j make a product. And then they often, as engineers want to do, just throw it over to the fence and say, okay, business, now it's your job to figure out what to do with this. And, uh, you know, the re at least half of the real engineering task for any product is thinking about how it actually gets used relative to your, your conceptions and working out the details to make sure that uh, it actually can be valuable. So I would say prediction markets have not yet worked gone very far in the, in, the, in the distance of figuring out what the real desires and needs for information organizations are, figuring out what the real uh, problems and barriers to inform using information organization and finding ways to change and adapt the product so that it can, uh, you know, give the things people really want to need. So, so when, when you came up with prediction markets and you started exploring that idea, what were your expectations? Where did you think this was going to lead? Did you have, did you think this was going to turn out quite differently? Well, I mean, I was young and idealistic and I'm perhaps uh, definitely older and perhaps a bit less idealistic, but uh, still substantially so. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought perhaps naively that uh, there was just more broad-based enthusiasm for the generic idea of um, knowing <laughs> answers to important questions better. That is, uh, we're in a world, complicated world and we have all these big questions that matter for our uh, organizations and, and national policy and all over the place. And uh, a lot of the barriers to making good decisions is not knowing answers to key questions. And I would have thought that there would be a lot more enthusiasm for uh, ways to get answers to those questions. Um, but that's based on a naive co conception of what people's concerns are and uh, how these processes are going on. So in fact, uh, people are really, you know, focused a lot on uh, how things make them look and uh, how they can support their allies and uh, oppose their rivals and uh, show their loyalty and show their ideological commitment and show their, you know, a wide range of complicated uh, social processes that uh, information is involved in. And prediction markets are just naively, I mean, it's, it's basically an autistic sort of uh, uh, lack of social savvy. They just sort of blunder in and tell the truth uh, when that's not the uh, socially acceptable thing to do. Let's take a short break to talk about our brand new sponsors, Hide.me. Uh, I've personally been using them for about a year, so I'm really excited to have them on. You know, you know, we sometimes take our, our, our privacy and security online for granted. I know that I did. I often tell people, if you use public Wi-Fi, uh, you might as well assume that your data has been compromised in some way. There's so many ways people can attack you nowadays. I mean, if you're using a website that isn't SSL, people can, on the same network as you, can pretty much see anything that you're doing on that website. And even SSL websites, uh, like your bank, social media, or Bitcoin wallets, for example, can be vulnerable to certain types of attacks. Uh, so, you know, as a Bitcoin user in your office or in a co-working space, or like if you're in a public Wi-Fi, someone could potentially target you just based specifically on the websites that you visit. Uh, now, you want to protect yourself against that. And to do that, you need Hide.me. Hide.me gives you an encrypted connection between your device and their network of servers. So attackers and even your ISP have no idea what you're doing. This all happens over super fast gigabit Ethernet, so there's no lags. And you have an encrypted tunnel there, uh, which protects you. And in addition to that, Hide.me keeps no logs of any of your activity. And the great thing about Hide.me is that they have a free plan. The free plan gives you up to two gigabytes of data per month at unthrottled bandwidth. And that's just enough so you can protect yourself whenever you use a cafe, when you're traveling, you're on an airplane, in an airport, uh, or use any public Wi-Fi spot. And you can sign up and get that free account when you go to Hide.me slash Epicenter. The great thing too is that if you ever decide later to get a premium account, then signing up with that URL is going to get you 35% off. The premium account includes unlimited bandwidth access to all their servers worldwide, and they've got lots of them. And it also lets you connect up to five devices simultaneously. You can use it on your mobile phone and with all your devices. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. Now, we'd like to welcome Hide.me as a new sponsor. We're excited about what they're doing. And of course, we would like to thank them for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So uh, in the in the in the Bitcoin and uh, in the cryptocurrency field, there is this belief that uh, prediction markets have not succeeded because 
there ha- like you say there have always been vested parties that do not want to see or have public the results of what these markets are of these markets because as you say they can some sometimes be autistic they give the bare truths to your face there's this belief in the field that uh, if you make a decentralized prediction market that is censorship resistant then uh, then the market can go on even when the person whose life would be influenced by the market doesn't want it to go on or the market will go on uh, when the government that will will be influenced by the market doesn't actually want the market to go on will this kind of censorship resistance actually help uh, prediction markets uh, go into the mainstream what do you think well i i think people overestimate the degree to which there is a vast pool of rebels waiting to resist the uh, uh you know the repression of authorities uh just eager for any chance to show their uh faith in the in the ideals of their society uh it it's you know a lot weaker than that so you know in most organizations uh you know there are uh people who at lower levels might want to be honest and tell the truth uh who might want to even pay a bit of a cost so career wise or socially in order to uh say honestly what they think about the organization but um it, it's easy to way overestimate just how enthused they are about that and how eager they are to do that <laughs> um so you know if if uh, in an organization um we could create this prediction the organization could pay to create this pr- prediction market on the deadline and then you know somebody gets embarrassed and they cut off the funding for that prediction market now we'd say well what if employees lower in the organization they can just go off to this website and make and make a market in whether this project will make the deadline and the authorities can't shut that market off and so it'll just uh you know shout the truth well i mean in a sense you know they could have already been doing that just going on to an external website with, with some sort of anonymous market so it's not necessarily that they couldn't have already done that but they show relatively little interest in bothering I mean, they could have just done that by setting up a chat site outside the company where they just talked about whether the project was going to make the deadline, and they don't bother to do that either. Um, so, um, yes, of course, uh, an outside chat site in the firm could let people talk about whether the project will make the deadline. They could have set that up. Uh, they could have had a meeting, a secret meeting, where they all came later on and talked about it. They could have a prediction market outside that's a play money market, or they could have a real money, you know, blockchain-based prediction market in a few years. But the question is well will they want to bother i mean it's not enough just to make it possible they you have to make something people care enough about to bother i guess the the use case people think more about is maybe not so much inside in organizations but then when you talk about you know political things right i, I guess that's also where in trade the the prediction market that has been most successful so far right the pol- politics was very big on their like elections right so maybe in something like that do you think I mean, well, I guess the question then becomes too, right? Is this just a betting site? And then what's a prediction market about it? You know, if, if so, it's right, just so let's making... Talk let's talk about that. So in the world of someplace like Intrade, um, you know, it was offshore, but uh, they, had rel- they, they could do many questions. And so a place like Intrade could have uh, had betting markets on all sorts of policy relevant topics that people might care about. I mean, you know, a large fraction of the topics that show up in newspaper articles or in academic journals that people argue about, there could have been bets about those things. Uh, but in fact, uh, the vast majority of bets on places like in trade or all these is basically sports bets. There are really very few bets on anything but sports. And then when they are betting on something that isn't sports, it may be elections, but it's really in, much in the sports vein of, of betting on a contest or a race. And the large space of abstract intellectual questions that people could bet on there's just very little demand for them over the years they did try a number of those i suggested a few and they just produced very little trading interest so so to be specific uh, i got some someone to subsidize create and subsidize some markets on in trade on um the some consequences of who would be of whether the republican or democrat would be president so there were markets in the oil prices and stock prices and troops abroad and things like that and that those are arguably, you know, very basic policy uh, relevant things to argue about in terms of who, who to elect. So there were big markets, of course, in whether the Democrat or Republican would be elected. 
Uh, but these markets in, if the Democrat was elected, how many troops would be abroad or what would stock prices be or, or oil prices be? There was just very little interest in that. Uh, and those were markets that could basically settle quick soon after the election. So um, when people go betting, uh, they want to bet on things that are things that will resolve quickly and that they're things that other people are arguing about. So if you, if you walk into a sports bar and, and you argue about who's going to win a you know, which team is going to win this Sunday, you can get a lot of people argue about with you. If you, if you start talking about uh, health insurance mandates uh, and whether those will reduce costs, uh, you'll find it hard to get anybody in the sports bar to take a bet or, or argue with you about it. I mean, it's just not what they're arguing about, right? So uh, I think it's somewhat naive to expect that um, there's just this huge groundswell of demand to want to bet on important policy questions. Um, there's a mild demand for it, but uh, and hopefully if we can make the cost low enough, that demand will be realized. But I have more hope about organizations who want to know things paying themselves to get the answers to the questions they want to know, as opposed to there just being a lot of people out there. So I, I more want to convince firms that they do want the market in, in their project deadline, and they want to pay for it, and they want to structure it and, and get them to try that out, then the idea that if the firm doesn't pay for it, even resist it, and tries to repress it, that the employees from the ground will all demand and create their own offshore, uh, off-site betting market that they all uh, insist on you know, playing every day because they are so into telling everybody about whether the project will make the deadline. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me a lot when you talk about prediction markets, and, and I think that's also why... I wanted to spend some time on that and explore this a little is of course the, the Bitcoin case because I, I remember when I learned about Bitcoin, I mean, I, was, I didn't have any a role of course in Bitcoin like you had in prediction markets, but when I learned about it, it was immediately, wow, this is amazing, incredible. And uh, it seems like people are just discovering about that because the price was going up. And it's like, it's pretty obvious to me that this is what the world is going to use and it's going to happen very fast. And so far it hasn't really happened and most people don't care. And even if people care in the abstract that they like the idea, they don't actually care to use it. Uh, and so it's, it seems interesting that there's, there seems to be a, a big similarity there. So is, is this a little bit how you look at Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and it's, it's, it's a bit like the thing you try to do with prediction markets, this like idealistic radical thing that actually doesn't satisfy real demand. I, well, I would just say more generally that there's just a large space of, you know, engineering and simple model inspired innovation, uh, which then has to go through a big second stage of working out what kind of products people actually want and, and the variations that will actually work. So it isn't specific per se to prediction markets or Bitcoin. There's just the larger world of innovating. Most innovators start with some simple concept of what products are for and what the use of what, what we do with various things and what kind of things would be useful how. And, you know, unless they're staying pretty close to an existing product, if they're moving away from existing products and generating a whole new product category, then they are generating that based on some abstract idea of what people might want. And there's there's just usually this disconnect where people's abstract idea of what people might want is usually rather far from what they end up actually wanting. And so many product ideas are stillborn in the sense that you, you, you try it out and nobody wants it and you just quit. And other ideas have more promise and then you, you need to adapt them to find the variation that people will want. And part of this barrier is not just ignorance. It's not just that, you know, most people who have ideas for products just you know, it's a big complicated world. They don't know all the details of it. Often one of the barriers is we have idealists, ideals. We, we have these theories in our head about what things should be for and what people should want. And uh, if we are overly confident in that, then we will uh, push too far for what people should want. So um, I don't know the Bitcoin world as well as I do um, prediction markets, but yes, obviously many of the concepts for Bitcoin and blockchain-based products are based on the kind of product people should want and the kinds of features of it they should want as opposed to what they do want. So I, I'm, I, I know there's reason, there are differences, but I'm, I'm always struck by the you know, product from 20 or 30 years ago of uh, uh, like PGP and private email and private communications, because that was based on the concept that people should want private email and they should be willing to pay a little extra trouble to download some different software and go through a few extra clicks to uh, support their private email. 
and of course, th there was perfectly reasonable uh, to believe that many people cared somewhat about privacy. I mean, people all the time talked about how much they cared about privacy and how upset they were that privacy was broken. And they, in the last few years, people claimed to be upset that Snowden discovered the NSA was reading everybody's emails, et cetera, and, fo and phone calls. They, they say they're upset and they say they, they want to do something about that. And they'd rather find a way, you know, they talk all that, but then, of course, they, they talk a little bit more than they do. And so, uh, you know, the, the uh, things like PGP have still been pretty marginal over... The last 20 years. Uh, and so, I mean, that's an obvious example of people saying, basically people care a bit about privacy, but a lot less than they the noise they make uh, when it seems like somebody else has taken their privacy without their permission. This kind of uh, reminds me about, uh, there was this classic book that was written in the 90s called Mega Mistakes by a guy called Steven Schnars. And he had this idea that most new technologies or concepts are going to fail. And only those technologies that improve on some aspect of somebody's life, lives by a factor of 10x, like 10 times, are going to, are, are going to succeed. Like, um, it should make something that the user cares about 10 times better than the current alternative out there. And, and, and maybe like the problem Bitcoin is having is, um, you're not finding that 10x improvement in the life of a Bitcoin user yet. Well, I, I think with Bitcoin, you have you have such strong network effects because as, as I think in Bitcoin is you always see like you see this world where everybody uses Bitcoin and then it's very easy to see these 10x improvements everywhere, right? But to get there, uh, it's not clear how you get there. And before you're there, it's not 10x improvement, it's actually worse in most cases, right? In most cases, now you have to deal with these, you know, private keys and, and whatnot. It's, a, it's actually interesting. Sebastian has sent me this uh, Radio Lab podcast episode, which was hilarious. It was about uh, this woman, some older Ukrainian woman in Boston that got this, uh, this virus. It was like a crypto locker sort of. So basically it encrypted all her files and it asked her to pay a ransom in Bitcoin. And so the woman talks about what an ordeal it was to get these horrible Bitcoins and how she had to send her passport. And then she got finally like $500 worth of Bitcoin uh, and then she wanted to pay, but then the, the price had dropped and, and she could not make sense how like this thing was not worth 500 anymore. So she didn't have enough uh, <laughs> and she only had 490. And and it was it was quite hilarious, and it it almost sounded like the worst part was not that her her files were encrypted, but that she had to go through this ordeal of trying to figure out how to use this Bitcoin thing. Um, so I think that's that's a problem we have, right? And the the other problem is, of course, you you see it's like if everybody used it, it would well ten x improvements everywhere, but before that. They're not here, right? So I mean, I don't know if prediction markets are similar in that there's such strong network effects. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, there's there's definitely effects of the form when only a small p number of people are using them. Uh, it's a lot more expensive to do so. Uh, there's a lot less social support, infrastructure, you know, tools, etc. So it's not quite the same as a network effect. But there's definitely things get cheaper when a lot of people use a product and service, uh, even when it's in, used individually. So. Uh, I definitely think, so I like to make the comparison with uh, cost accounting in firms. Uh, if nobody did cost accounting in firms and you propose that uh, this project in this particular firm uh, have cost accounting applied to it, uh, you'd be basically saying, uh, somebody's stealing here and we need to check and find out who that is. And that, that might be pretty unwelcome advice or, or news. You know, you're basically accusing somebody around here of stealing. Uh, in a world where everybody does cost accounting and you say, let's just not do cost accounting on this project. How about that, guys? <laughs> Uh, you'd be basically saying, I'd like to steal a little. Is that all right with you? Uh, can we cover that up? <laughs> and uh, that also wouldn't go over so well. So, uh, you know, it matters a lot what the usual thing is, uh, whether you can do any one thing uh, different in any one place. So in a world where nobody does pr prediction markets, if you say, we should do prediction markets here, you're basically saying, you know, our usual way of talking about this stuff and deciding what is, it's bullshit. We keep lying to ourselves. So we need something else. <laughs> Not such welcome news. 
in a world where everybody basically always did a prediction market on a project to see if it was going to make the deadline, if you said, I think we should do this project and let's get going, but let's not do a prediction market on this one, please. Let's just skip that step. <laughs> You'd be basically <laughs> saying, yeah, we're not going to make this deadline, but let's not talk about that. Okay, guys? <laughs> and that would look bad too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, the more we can create a standard of people using it. So that's also, of course, true of, uh, you know, encrypted email. Uh, you know, if almost nobody's using encrypted email and I tell you, hey, how about you and I use encrypted email? Why don't you do download the software? All of a sudden you're going, you're, you know, what, 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 what's he trying to do here? <laughs> what kind of secrets does he want me involved in? Do I want to be involved in that? And, you know, I'll set up all sorts of red flags. If every, if everybody's email was automatically encrypted, then there's nothing strange about talking to somebody that way. It's just the usual thing and it doesn't raise any questions. So a similar issue, of course, with blockchains, uh, you know, the question is what are they going to be used for? And is that going to be a typical enough thing that it's okay to just use it for usual things so that it doesn't make you look weird or suggest you're doing something different? So at, at the moment, people can say, oh, I'm just into it because it's new and cool. And that's a reasonable excuse. And so it doesn't look too bad to be using it if you're saying, I just like, I'm a techie guy and I like things that are new and cool. But after a while, that's going to go away. And, uh, you know, and you, you're trying to avoid the situation where you say, I'm using Bitcoin and somebody else thinks, ah, you're doing drugs, you know, because, <laughs> hey, that's what the only thing everybody ever uses this thing for, right? So uh, you definitely have to create this wider set of common applications that are accepted that um, don't flag you as, as being uh, something illicit merely by using it. Today's magic word is futarchy, F-U-T-A-R-C-H-Y. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. Let's take the time out to imagine a world in which people are using prediction markets and they have uh, broken through into mainstream society, as you alluded to. And uh, you have this proposal of uh, how government would work in such a society, and you call it futaki. So we'd like to know what, uh, what a society that has adopted futaki would look like. How would it make decisions? How would, would it make laws? Okay. So let's first talk about governance as opposed to government, <laughs> because uh, governance happens in all sorts of scales. And so um, futaki is a proposal for governance and eventually it could be applied to the largest scale governance issues like national governments and even international. But uh, since it's a governance mechanism, it can and should be applied first at much smaller scales. So um, the, the prediction markets, again, are markets that produce information. Uh, and of course, the value of information in standard decision theory is that it helps you make decisions. Uh, there's not much point in just collecting information because there it is. Uh, you want to collect information that sits next to a decision you're going to make. The closer you can get to a decision, the more valuable the information. So if you have a project uh, that might go over a deadline, the reason why you might want to know if it's going to go over a deadline is because there's something you could do about it. <laughs> if it's not going to make the deadline, then you can delay the marketing of the product, or you can change who's in charge of the product, you can kill the product. There's, there's things you can do. Uh, if there's nothing you can do about it, there's no point in bothering to find out if you make the deadline. You just will or won't and, and live with it. So... Uh, fundamentally, the reason why we want information is because we make decisions. Um, but most of the prediction markets that are typically created, there's a substantial distance between uh, the information we're asking about and the decision you're going to make. And usually you just, people have often just thought, what might I want to know? And they make some markets on that. And they don't think very much about what I could use it for. And they often realize later on that they didn't really want to know. It wasn't <laughs> something that was actionable. They couldn't do much with it. So uh, they, they quit. They, they just give up. And that's one of the reasons prediction markets are often uh, don't last that long in organizations is even if they don't bother somebody, they turn out not to be useful because they didn't actually ask the questions people cared about. So decision markets are a way to make prediction markets very close to a decision. So uh, let me give you a, a concrete example of a decision market because uh, it has, has a lot of uh, ways to explain and applications, which is one of the biggest decisions most firms make is whether to fire the CEO. So CEOs make a big addition to firms when the fee CEO is, isn't doing well or not, not a good match. Uh, it's really important to fire the CEO. And so it's important to decide whether you should fire the CEO. Now, it's, it's well known that most boards of directors are shy about firing CEOs uh, because often the CEO put them there or if they try to fight the CEO, he'll fight back and he's got a lot of weapons. And so they usually just let them go. And so CEOs stay too long. So uh, you could have a prediction market 
uh, related to how the seat firm is doing, uh, you know, and predicting the future outcomes of the firms, but that's not very directly relevant to should you fire the CEO. Uh, so a decision market on should you fire the CEO could be product constructed and it would go the following. You, you could have, say, a, a stock market. It could, uh, you could have a public company, for example, and you could have a stock price. And that stock price goes up or down as people expect the future of the company to do well or poorly. And you could have a market in the stock price that's conditional on whether the CEO leaves or not. That is, uh, an ordinary stock price, you just trade cash for the stock uh, and you're willing to pay more cash when you think the stock is worth more. In a conditional market, you make conditional trades. That is, trades that are called off if the condition is not met. So you could trade cash for stock for the company conditional on the CEO staying this quarter or conditional on the CEO leaving this quarter. So the idea is to create both of those markets and that would have two different prices. Uh, one price represents what people think the company is going to be worth on average if the CEO stays and the other represents what they think the company is worth on average if the CEO leaves. And so now the difference in those prices is the consensus speculator estimate of whether or not the, the CEO is good for the company. Now, to settle these mar markets later, we only need to know if the CEO came or left and whether the stock price later is high or low. We don't actually need to know if the CEO was directly really causally helpful to the company or not. We don't ever have to judge that. All we have to judge is, did the CEO leave and what was the later stock price? But just knowing those two things later lets us settle these bets. But ex ante, when we're making the bets, we are incentivized to reveal what we believe about the effect of the CEO on the company. We should set these conditional probabilities, these conditional estimates to our best estimate of them. So this is a decision market in whether to dump the CEO. So you can, the basic structure here, there's two parts. One is there's a discrete decision to make. You, you can say, we're going to do this or this or that, and you can lay them out ahead of time. We're going to do one of these things. And the other part is the outcome we care about. In this case, it's the uh, stock price of the company later. So if we've got discrete decisions, clear outcomes, we can set up a decision market. So futarchy is uh, an application of decision markets. So we can, of course, create decision markets on many decisions, like whether to fire the CEO, and we could create them with many different outcomes and many different decisions, and they could be typically advisory. So uh, my, my proposal, if I had a million dollars, which I posted on, is I would go offshore and I'd create these markets on firing the CEO for the entire Fortune 500. So a thousand markets, two for each company. Uh, and I still thought that would be a great guerrilla marketing because all the CEOs would pay attention to the market. You'd get lots of press attention. And after a couple of years, you'd have enough statistics to decide whether the, in fact, the companies that are following the advice are doing better. After which point you could probably pressure boards of directors into following the advice for fear of uh, being sued for not taking well, you know, do, being good uh, trustees of their company. Yeah, that's a cool. Idea. Let, let me ask uh, one question about the mechanism because I, I don't, I'm not sure I fully understand that. Because so there's a market now for what's the share price if we keep the CEO, and there's a market for what's the share price if we don't keep the CEO. And then the higher share price is going to determine our decision, right? It's the term of the recommendation for your decision, yes. Right. But so let's assume that's binding or something. So let's assume that, oh, if the share price, people say, oh, if the CEO stays, the share price is going to be higher. So they, they pay more for that. But then, I mean, why can't this be manipulated, right? Because you never know you never know what didn't happen, right? So, so the people trading in, in the lower market that, you know, of, of those, that event that's never gonna, gonna occur, how, how, how do the economics of this work? So, uh, you know, the, the typical scenario here, the simplest scenario, let's say, is where the market is just advisory. Uh, and so uh, all you need is that people think there's some chance that either condition will happen. If you're really sure that a condition won't happen, then you have very little interest in uh, betting on the condition. So, you know, we could have betting markets on if Santa Claus shows up tomorrow, what, what will we do? Uh, but since <laughs> none of us believe Santa Claus will show up, we, we just have very little interest, uh, no interest really at all in bothering to bet on those markets. So, so the market's price will be pretty meaningless. Uh, there probably wouldn't be much of a price. Uh, so we need a condition that people think has a chance of happening. It doesn't need a 90% chance. It might even only have a 10 or 1% chance of happening, but the, the smaller the chance of something of a condition happening, the less interested people are in bothering to bet on a conditional market because their profits are proportional to the probability that the condition will happen. Other uh, losses are as well. So um, 
in order to get people to bother to bet in a market, you, you need some chance that it might happen. Now, of course, in most companies, uh, there is a substantial chance every quarter that the CEO will leave. Uh, you know, the average tenure is maybe 10 years or something. So that's one in 40 for every quarter. So, uh, you know, there's a 2% chance every quarter that the CEO will leave. So uh, that could give you enough of a chance to bother to bet on what would happen if the CEO left this quarter. Uh, th that's, of course, if, if you think there's that chance. Now, uh, the sh more sure you get that one or the other decisions are going to happen, uh, the harder it is to get people to, to tell you about what they think will happen in other conditions. So uh, decision markets to uh, are work better when uh, there is actual uncertainty about the decision. Uh, certainly among the people who are advising the market, who are betting on the market, they can be sure. Now, obviously, one mechanically, one way to just ensure this is just to have some small random chance of actually doing the decision randomly. So, you know, if if one in a thousand, if, if, if every time, you know, if every quarter the uh, board just, you know, rolled some dice and, and had a, had a uh, you know, one in a thousand chance of dumping the CEO just based on the dice roll, uh, well, now... <laughs> That could give you enough of a chance to be sure that he'll go up. But of course, we know in the real world, there's just people die randomly at various times, right? CEOs are just sometimes die. And there's enough of a chance of that randomly happening that that'll give you a small chance that the CEO will leave this quarter. Uh, and so and there's there's other random things that can go wrong, you know, in the world. So I, I don't think you have to worry that the chance is going to fall below one in a thousand. Uh, but of course, the smaller the chance, the less effort will put it, people will put into it. And so the more noisier the prices would be. It's time for a word from our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade cryptocurrencies, to trade all coins. And they now support about 50 uh, old coins and cryptocurrencies. So if you want to trade all coins, there's different ways to do it. You can use an old fashioned exchange. It's a bit like using MS-DOS and getting angry at your computer. Or you can use Shapeshift to make this the most heavenly part of your day. And uh, now go to shapeshift.io and you can get this done in less than a minute. The great thing too is that you don't even need to sign up for an account. In fact, if you try to sign up for an account, you'll get very frustrated because there is no way to do it. So you're, if you're an altcoin high roller, you're going to love their higher limit option that they've just added. It used to be that you could only trade like pretty small amounts of, uh, of altcoins, like for example, like four Bitcoins worth maximum. But now you can specify higher amounts. So for example, if you wanna buy like 500 Litecoins, you can now do that on Shapeshift. So go to shapeshift.io and give it a try. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So the interesting thing about this future target discussion, you know, when we talk about this, when we talk about it like this, it's, it's, it seems this abstract futuristic concept that's like far away, but actually, when we come back to sort of, you know, the usual topic of this show, which is like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and decentralized technologies, then I think some a concept like futurarchy is extremely relevant and it's extremely pressing. And the reason is that one, you do want decentralization, right? So you want to have some process that can be captured by some entity or government that determines, uh, you know, first of all, with Bitcoin the transactions and stuff, and I guess Bitcoin has that part semi-handled. I mean, there's, of course, problems there too. But then how are how is it updated, right? So we've had the, with the block size debate, as we've talked about this many times, and we've also been started talking about governance. We've tried to talk about governance. And Bitcoin doesn't have a proper governance model. Um, and the, the result of that is that decision there's just no decisions are made almost it's like a stalemate and people disagree there's no way of resolving disagreements and so i think with bitcoin you know future key may be one of the few candidates that actually could solve this right so uh, is, is this an area you're watching and do, do you think that could actually be where now prediction markets will break through because people will see what happens with bitcoin and they will say maybe Bitcoin itself will do that, or maybe people will do that with other projects to say, well, the next time we're building something, we need to build a prediction market in there from the ground up so we never get into this situation where like no decision can be reached. Right, so I mean, from the point of view of being a cautious, careful, reasonable researcher or thinker, uh, you know, the obvious thing to recommend is that new ideas should be tried on small scales first and slowly worked away to larger trials until uh, you do something, you, you have enough evidence 
to try something big. Um, of course, uh, often what you have is that the small scale trials never happen. And so we've got all these interesting ideas for changes that people don't even try on the small scale. So uh, sometimes what often happens in, in actually is that you create these ideas for, for changes and then they just sit there until somebody's desperate, <laughs> until a crisis. <laughs> Somebody out there uh, just needs something <laughs> and it's on the shelf and you've been waiting for a decade or two with your proposal and suddenly, boom, they gra grab it off the shelf and they give it a try. Uh, you know, when you're desperate, you're willing to try more things uh, than you otherwise would, um, but you have pretty, you know, tight criteria too. So I would rather we started with small scale trials and worked our way up, but hey, uh, somebody who's desperate is, is uh, also something I'm willing to go with and help. <laughs> so, you know, it's a bit of a Hail Mary pass, if you will, of, of taking something that hasn't been tried on small scales. You don't have a lot of data, uh, but I do think the blockchain world has this fundamental problem. I mean, that the whole... The whole initial conception was that you had an idea of something, of how a system would work, and then you wrote it in code, and then you sent it out there, and now that it's out there, nobody can stop it. Ha! Right? So the, the whole appeal was, once we get everybody using it, nobody can stop it. But of course, the flip side is that nobody can change it, right? And uh, nobody can stop it or nobody can change it is, is great if you thought it was great. If you, if you need to have it evolve and change in response to conditions because it wasn't quite right in the first place, well, now you're in big trouble uh, because you don't Nobody can stop it. And nobody can change it. And nobody can anything. So, uh, you know, that's that's the key question this community is stuck at. Right? Is is somebody made something and they made, and they looked pretty good and they threw it out there and in such a way and we, we everybody jumped and said, hey, if enough of us get on this, then nobody can stop it. And here we are. Now it's going and nobody can stop it. Right? And nobody can change it. And now you realize it's not quite what you wanted. And what do you do? Uh, so. And maybe now you realize, okay, well, we, we, need, we needed to do all this back from the beginning, but oops, uh, we needed to have some governance as part of this. <laughs> we needed like a process that somebody could not stop that included governance so that it could make itself better when there were problems. And that was something that wasn't included in the initial concept here. Uh, it, was a, it was a system that it did not include governance because it was under the basic engineering presumption that you got a design and you work it out and you, you release the design and if you know you, you ran your software tests and they probably, I'm sure it, these things passed their initial software tests <laughs> uh, and they have passed a bunch of initial practical tests too but eventually you know real systems that get that get big and move into new contexts almost all real systems they do need adaptation to context and so how are you going to do adaptation to context that that's the real question so you you're searching for a governance mechanism and now you realize you know most of the governance mechanisms people have are also things that let people like stop things <laughs> Right, a city does something one way, and the national government doesn't like it. And you know, if you have a governance mechanism to oversee the thing you're doing in the city, then the gov national government will come and say, "Stop it! We don't like it," and the city is going to have to stop it because there are ways to pressure the governance mechanism. So you want to set up something people can't stop, but you want to govern it. So you need a governance mechanism people can't pressure so easily, right? And so you, now you need a decentralized governance mechanism that's hard to pressure, and that there aren't so many of those out there in the literature, right? Well, what else you got? Yeah, I mean, so like like the current alternative that the community has is just discussing on Reddit, and those uh, like those those are they have a, a big big problem because anyone can post they the, the discussions they they result in something that is barely readable, and you have the strange people coming, anonymous people commenting anything on on the block size debate. So uh, Bitcoin does need a governance mechanism and Futaki seems like a crazy idea to most people, but like it's one of the only ideas out there. So maybe you could take the time out and just hash out what it rough what it would roughly look like. Like in your in your Futaki proposal you have these values and these beliefs. And we'd like just like to understand what values for Bitcoin would be, what beliefs would be, and how they would interact. So we were talking about decision markets and we didn't quite get to how it would work as a governance mechanism as opposed to a go advising governance. So we, we were just talking about advisory decision markets so far. And then the final step is to make them formally in charge. So to make a uh, decision market kind of mechanism formally be in charge as a governance mechanism, you need to have a little bit more than what I described before. Uh, you need to pick an outcome that's the official outcome. Uh, and or a way in which that official outcome can be changed. So in my 
paper on the subject uh, in the Journal of Political Philosophy. The slogan is vote on values, but bet on beliefs. So in that scenario, I imagine that there's a, val you know, a voting process by which it's analogous to something we're doing today. People, there are legislatures and they pass bills and they vote on what the outcome measure could be. And so in that scenario, um, you could revise and change the outcome measure. Um, in, in the Bitcoin world, uh, it's less clear how you're going to revise the outcome measure. And so uh, you might need to pick some outcome measure and stick with it, which, which is also a lack of flexibility that could come to bite you later. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, what we need is a official outcome measure, uh, either fixed forever or the result of some process that can modify it that would have to be specified. And then in addition to that, you need a way to make policy proposals, uh, an official channel by which a idea becomes an official proposal, such that it must officially be considered. And then once there is an official outcome measure and an official way to make proposals, then the spec, then you invoke a betting market basically. And you say there has to be some official betting markets, i.e. a place you go to look for the price. And the rule of government is that you look at the official betting markets for the price on whether the proposal would improve the outcome. And you have to look at that at some time or some average over time. And it has to be, of course, using some whatever the asset is in this market that you're trading that's measured, that's connected to this outcome. Uh, and then at some at the right point in time, you look at the price and you see if the price is above the threshold, then the rule of government says we adopt the proposal and boom, there it is. It's now the default and, and it could be overcome again by a new proposal. So those are the extra things you need to turn this decision market into a governance mechanism here. You need an outcome measure that's official and a way to change it if, you, if you're going to allow that. You need a way to make policy proposals that are official and we can talk about how you limit that so there's not too many of them. And then you need the markets that are official, i.e. where we're going to go to look at the price. And we have to decide when we look at the price. Uh, and then the rule is some the automatic mechanism looks at the price and makes the decision. And if the price is high enough relative to the status quo, you just do it. So, so that's, a, that's like a lot of concepts. Maybe we could just map these concepts to what they would be in Bitcoin for, for, a, for, sure. for, for, for it to make better sense. So for example, when, I, when you say outcome measure, I tend to think of the price of a Bitcoin in dollar because that is a measure right. that's so, very obvious on the system. Right. So, I mean, more robustly, you might think that if you're going to allow quantity changes in Bitcoins or something, then it would be the price times the quantity that you would want to track. But of course, in, in scenarios where the number of Bitcoins don't change, the price is a, is a reasonable proxy. But then you might also want to tie it to some stable measure of th value besides the dollar. It's always possible the dollar will undergo some terrible inflation. And so you might want to pick some more stable value, like some average of world um, currencies or an average of world stock prices or something, Th those, even though they would be more trouble to monitor, they would be more robust to uh, possible fluctuations in the dollar. Um, you know, th those, th that would be details that you might want to pay attention to. But yes, it does seem like, uh, you know, the, just the total quantity value of the coins might be a reasonable robust uh, me value of measure here. Uh, you know, you could also, of course, do transaction volume uh, but you might worry a bit more about that. Honestly, I think, um, you know, having any decent governance me mechanism tied to any ge decent outcome measure is just such a big gain over what you're likely to actually end up with. I wouldn't like haggle too much about the exact outcome measures. I'd just worry about whether you can get anything going. So, I mean, like another outcome measure could be perhaps some some measure of of decentralization, like how much does it take for me to, uh, for people around the world to run full nodes, for example? So, I mean, if it is cheap for people to run full nodes, then Bitcoin has, has, can be a more decentralized system. So like, perhaps you could have outcome measures like which are price, right. then volume. The problem with volume, of course, is that uh, uh, the, some determined attacker can, could just spam the network and uh, create volume artificially. So you want to be sensitive to whether these measures you choose can be manipulated, but you also want to be sensitive to whether they're like constraints and conditions as opposed to the thing you really care about, uh, because, you know, it will really try to maximize whatever you, you give to it. So, uh, you know, if you just made it, uh, this cost of doing these, uh, full, full nodes, and that was your only outcome measure, then it might be able to just achieve that. And then it wouldn't care about anything else. 
and then it might not do things that would increase like the total size and use of the community once it had achieved this 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 thing of just making the cost low. So you, you would I would think you'd want to pick an outcome measure that continues to be hard, however far you go along that line, so that you continue to keep moving. So I, I would think you might want to like, you know, you could put you could do a product of the Bitcoin price times some measure of this cost that you expect. You know, as long as the cost is a, is below some threshold, you're okay with it or something, so that it, it saturates. It it seems like this so clearly also illustrates how hard of a problem is and how that probably, to be quite honest, isn't going to be the solution, right? Because even if you look at something like where one maybe could agree on, like the Bitcoin, you know, the Bitcoin, the total volume as a total value of you know quantity times price, right? Of course. If you looked at the Bitcoin community today, you know there, there will be multiple ways of, of maximizing that quantity, but of course one would just be by increasing the volume, which uh, of course would dilute existing holders and do huge resistance there, you know. So so people would definitely not agree on that, and uh, and then the problem is, I think as you said, but would that know, in fact increase the total value of all the bitcoins if they increase the volume? It's not obvious it would. It's not. It's not obvious, right? But uh, let's say, uh, you know, let's say increasing the volume by a factor of ten would half the price. You know, I mean, who who would those new bitcoins go to? I mean, if they went to existing well, bitcoin holders, I mean, of course, if you it makes increase the volume difference. by a factor of ten and the price went down by more than a factor of ten, then uh, the optimization would be failing, right? So the question right, is, right? But would... let's say let's say the the price would go down by a factor of two. Well, in that case, you would have increased the total value by five, and then this criteria would approve of it, and maybe exactly. it would be a good thing. Maybe it would be a good thing, but if you ask yeah. the, the current Bitcoin holders, right. they would yeah. probably say, this is not a good thing. I liked my Bitcoin more when I, you know, when I still own more of it. Well, I mean, let's get back to the desperate point, right? I mean, the whole reason why you're even considering this is like you're stuck in a corner where you don't have that many great options. Uh, otherwise, you know, we, you would wait and see, like, let this technology develop on small scale and work its way up. But the only reason you're even considering it now, when it hasn't been worked out and tested, is you're kind of desperate. Uh, you need something here, and, and you need it sometime, you know, soon, and you need it to be, you need it to work. So that puts a high priority on just picking something simple that's clear, that seems workable, and just doing it even if it's not optimally what anybody wants, because you need something. Yeah, that's quite right. Uh, I mean, of course, opinions differ on that. I was, I was in contact with Peter Todd just recently, and he was like, no, it's actually good that there's no governance process because it should be hard to update it. And, you know, if, we, if it can be updated, you know, that's, that is as desired. And, of course, the opinions completely differ. So in, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, it's complicated. <laughs> right. I, I get, I'm sure there must also be the issue of uh, whether a gov pressure could be applied to a governance mechanism. So once you have a governance mechanism that says it allows a change, then you know, the government could say, okay, everybody, we need this change because we need you guys to be under our thumb. And now if you don't adopt the following change, uh, there's going to be this hell to pay. And now you know, it's pressuring the governance mechanism to adopt the proposal. So once you can change something, you are now open to pressuring to being pressured to make changes that somebody else wants if they have a way to pressure you, to make a threat, basically. They can make a threat, a credible threat, of somehow hurting the entire system if you don't do what they want, then they can pressure a government's mechanism to do what they want. So you have to wonder, are you able to stand up to whatever pressure they will try to impose uh, in order to make the decisions they want? And, and when it comes to you know, let's say mining pools being in charge of that, that voting power or in charge of that mechanism, then the answer would probably be no, you're not able to stand up because actually people can be located and they can send people there with these data centers, arrest yeah. people and all. So the, the ability to resist pressure is actually not that high. Well, you got to expect a governance mechanism will allow you to adapt, but will also <laughs> adapt to threats and you will adapt to threats and therefore you will succumb to threats. It's walking down the game tree, as we call it, as the economists, figure out what the consequence of these actions would be. I think in any case, people will try things like that. And, you know, I know, I know Vitalik of Ethereum has written a long blog post and they didn't, even if this is a, is a, is a very daring and out there 
idea and I think I am sure many people will end up setting up some sort of futarchy systems in the cryptocurrency space and they will make mistakes like that you know they'll choose the wrong parameter and it's gone and I'm sure there will be lots of mistakes but I certainly look forward to seeing that some of that experimentation. So I mean, the right, I mean, a compromise would be to identify the parameters that you don't want outside threats on and don't allow governance on those. So I mean, that's analogous to the constitution of a country or something. You just have uh, some parameters that you make very hard to change, but would, you know, which is why a constitutional co conventions and amendments are very hard. And you make other parameters that are easy to change. So if there are parameters that you don't, you're not very worried about threats changing. They just need, they're just parameters of administration and, and management such that, you know, if you don't get them right, things just go badly, but nobody's really going to want to threaten you on. Uh, you could make those parameters easier to change and then hold off on some other parameters as just out of, out of the range of change, unless there's this really, really strong consensus. So you could set a consensus parameter, like what percentage of all the miners have to agree on something before uh, that thing can be changed. You probably would want to just set some of these things way off to the side so that you need 99.9% .9 of <laughs> agreement before those parameters can change. So, so for example, like you, you could have something, uh, you could have futarchy, uh, can, could you have futarchy as a settlement mechanism for disputes that are beyond a certain size? What I'm trying to say is, uh, let's say there's, there's one proposal which is just to add a particular new opcode to the scripting language. There's some disagreement, but you could think of the disagreement as like 80-20. Like most miners you would ask uh, are in favor of this new opcode and this has happened in the past. Those things don't go to the futarchy, so that's settled. But when you have a split where the miners are split 50-50 or the core developers are split 60-40, it's, it's those situations that are really hard and you could fall back on futarchy as an option because both the options obviously are, are are pretty good. Otherwise, a lot of the community won't be supporting each one, each one of them. And then you could use futarchy in those, uh, in only those circumstances. Once you have a set of governance mechanisms possible, you, you have a big combinatorial space in which you, ways you can combine them. I mean, that, that's just generally true of all design uh, parameters and features. Uh, I would think that um, the issue is just more, do you have any plausible governance mechanism here that meets some minimal constraints? That's It's not whether you find the optimal. I, I would worry less about finding the optimal or, one and more, for, worry more about, do you have anything that just works at a basic level? Uh, so if you've got some voting mechanism and it works for lots of things, well, now you should be a lot less worried because, hey, you've got something that works. Uh, if you have a few key mechanism that works and then great, you've got something that works. But I, I, think, I think at the moment that your problem is, do you have anything that works? Not can you combine it in some optimal way? I mean, in the case of Bitcoin, right, the, the sort of way it works is that there's code that's run, right? Code that determines what's a valid block and then sort of what the majority runs of that code, that is, you know, the authoritative sort of truth and rules of the network. Now, in a way, there's a bunch of people in charge of that code and, you know, they can change it. And then it sort of depends whether people upgrade it or go somewhere else. But so there is some sort of very weird type of governance mechanism. It's not maybe, you know, is it certainly not perfect? And I think one big problem is that um, these people certainly accomplished developers, but they weren't elected. They don't really represent necessarily Bitcoin users. And there's so much inertia there that to try to get people to change something else is extremely difficult. So they ended up having a ton of power from being in that position. And I think that happened a, sort of a little bit by accident, but now there's like no way out. Well, I mean, you, you do want some cost of change in governance. I mean, that's why we often make it hard to change uh, rules in government. Uh, so uh, it's not a terrible thing if there is a substantial cost to make changes because there are a lot of things that go wrong when change is easy. So that this is just a general thing we know about governance. Uh, in different contexts, you, you try to adjust the cost of change to trade off 
the need to adapt from the uh, cost that can happen when the, the, the things that go wrong when, when cost is too easy. So uh, when change is too easy, I'm sorry, uh, then there can be awful lobbying. There can be uh, a lot of what we call rent seeking, people pushing for things to get personal advantages, a lot of a attention people have to pay to things that other people are trying to push for so they can protect their interests. Uh, there's just a lot of costs in, in real systems when change is relatively easy. So I mean, a standard story we have like in, in, in organizational theory is that uh, when you have like a travel office, they usually have a bunch of rules about travel that are just hard to change. That is, you know, what, what kind of travel you can get reimbursed for, whether it's a plane ticket or a cab or whatever. They've just got a bunch of standard rules and no, they don't want to change it. And if you've got some exception, they don't want to hear about it. And you think, well, that's not very adaptive. What if, what if my circumstance is different? What if, what if something changed here? Shouldn't they like pay attention to the details? Well, if they start to pay attention to the details, then they'll get lobbied a lot. Then they'll have all these people who come up all the time saying you should make this exception and that exception and the other exception. And they'll have to react to that and people have to do all this lobbying and they just make a decision. No, we're just going to have a simple world. We're not going to change it. And that'll minimize all these costs. So by analogy here, you sh there should be some cost of change. It should be, uh, not easy to make change exactly because uh, you'll end up with all these uh, costs if you do. But you don't want to make it so hard that you can't ever change <laughs> if you need to change. Uh, so that's really the question is, do you have a way to make substantial change even at a substantial cost when substantial change is, is really needed? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Robin, thanks so much for coming on. We're at the, the end of our show, but really uh, enjoyed this discussion. And I think and I hope that this sort of intersection of decentralized technology, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and prediction markets is going to become quite interesting. I mean, I know there are some projects uh, in the space, Augury mentioned, and there's some other ones too, uh, who are building prediction markets in this way. And we'll see, maybe it will be like a lot of other attempts and that they don't go too far. But maybe actually there's something there, right? So uh, in any case, right. I, I am very, very excited to see how they turn out. So we, we academics are usually like big fans of innovation somewhere else, right? In our own little world, we don't innovate very much and we're not very interested, but we, we, we like to take credit for innovation somewhere else. So in the same way, you know, I'm sure people stuck in the middle of this, they're really scared about any of these options because they could all go wrong, but I'm on the outside. So I just, yeah, it would be great if you guys tried something because it would sure be fun to watch. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks so much for coming on. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll link to your blog, uh, also your Twitter and, uh, and your book. Is it out already? Uh, not till March. Not till March, but I presume- Six months to go. Perhaps there's some pre-order site in case, uh, which is actually, it's on Singularity more, so not exactly on topic, but if you've yeah. liked what Robin sure. talked about and you think he looks like someone who would write a good book, uh, then you, know, you can perhaps pre-order that book. All right. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on and, you know, thanks Meher for, you know, your second episode. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for coming on, Robin. It was really it was good great. to talk to you. Take care. Yeah, and to your listeners, thanks so much for joining us. You know, we put out episodes every Monday. You can get the episodes in your favorite podcast player or see them on YouTube. And it's on youtube.com slash episode BTC, by the way. Apologies for the terrible lighting. It's going to be better soon. Uh, and if you're a loyal listener, then we still have this bribery competition going on, which is that you leave a iTunes review for us and you can say wonderful things or horrible things that's irrelevant. And we will send you a t-shirt, uh, at least as long as we have still have some. And uh, if the rate of reviews keep up the same way and <laughs> So uh, many of you have done that and thanks so much for all the wonderful things you've said. Uh, and so thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.